Hello and welcome to this edition of Sardar TV. I'm Tracy Fitzpatrick. Joining us today is former Marine turned banker, CEO, and now author Ken Marlin. Currently, he is managing partner at investment bank Marlin & Associates. In his new book, The Marine Corps Way to Win on Wall Street, he shares the skills and principles needed to win across battlefields to boardrooms. Ken, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you for having me here. So let's get right into the nitty gritty of this fascinating book. Tell us what the theme is of your brand new book, The Marine Corps Way to Win on Wall Street. You know, the, um, the short answer to that, I suppose, is that I have spent the last 30 years going back and forth between running technology companies uh, as a CEO, as an entrepreneur, uh, as a corporate executive, and for the past nearly 15 of those years as running a, uh, an investment bank and a strategic advisory firm advising many of those same types of companies and along the way, I was frustrated, quite frankly, at some of the foolish things that I saw CEOs do, that I saw bankers do, uh, sometimes embarrassed by the comments my friends would make about bankers as they watched Orange County, California go bankrupt after bankers uh, convinced people to buy foolish instruments, or the same thing happened in Alabama. Uh, in Montgomery where, again, they bought foolish instruments, J just sort of watching bankers, but also CEOs sometimes take advantage of the unsophisticated, the unwary, uh, the weak. And, uh, and I used to regularly say to my friends, why can't CEOs, why can't bankers simply live by some of the same principles I was taught as a Marine. They would make just as much money. They would be way less embarrassed. They wouldn't be paying all this money in fines. They wouldn't be subject to ridicule. And people said to me, why don't you write it down? Why don't you write a book about it? And, and, and that became the genesis of the book. It became about a better way to run businesses. And because I've spent nearly the last uh, 20 years on Wall Street, um, a, a better way to run Wall Street firms and a better way for bankers to help advise their clients. And how has your background helped in writing this book, whether on the battlefields or in the boardrooms? Talk about a little bit of both. My background, uh, as you know, is somewhat varied. Um, I, uh, I did spend 10 years in the Marine Corps on, on active duty. Um, I served uh, two tours in the Far East. I spent a lot of time in a lot of fun places, uh, including a month in the snow in Alaska, but that's not my only background. Um, I then spent 10 years as a corporate executive helping to lead global strategy for Dun & Bradstreet. Uh, back in the days when Dun & Bradstreet was a, a, a diversified holding company of which the information technology company, the credit information company that we know it as today, was one of 23 different divisions. So D&B in those days owned AC Nielsen, which does the media and TV ratings. It owned IMS Health, which tracks the movement of pharmaceuticals. It owned the Gartner Group, which knows all about computer technology. It owned Moody's, the bond rating company. And I spent 10 years helping that company develop and execute strategies. I, I then led as a CEO two different technology companies. I uh, got financial backing. I bought one of those companies, made uh, an acquisition in the UK, made another acquisition in Japan, did a joint venture with Nomura, uh, and ultimately sold that company. And, and along the way, I, I raised equity capital for my company, debt capital, uh, sold that company, and then went back and worked for the people who bought my company, another large organization, for another few years before going into the investment banking world. I, I should say that in those first 10 years at Dun & Bradstreet, I was involved in uh, nearly 60 merger and acquisition transactions, and along the way, subsequently, was involved in quite a number. Uh, and so was invited to an investment bank, merchant bank, private equity fund, sort of all rolled into one to help them uh, make acquisitions and advise clients. And then, as I said, for the nearly 15 years I've been running my own bank, those varied experiences combine to give me a background on nearly 
all sides, not only of the merger and acquisition world, but of the strategy development world and the execution world as a CEO. Um, and it's that combination that I believe gives me a pretty decent background to write about what it takes to win on Main Street and to win on Wall Street. Why did you think it was important to write this type of book? And can you uh, equate life and death on the battlefield, re really compare it to the dollars and cents in the boardroom? It's clear that being in the comfort of a, of a mainstream business is not exactly the same as being on the battlefield. I'd never say that it is. Um, but there are decisions that CEOs make, there are decisions that bankers make that affect the rise and fall of companies, they affect people's jobs, they affect their livelihoods, they affect their careers, and in some cases, more than that. One of the principles in my book uh, is about taking a stand, which is to some extent about um, a need for people to be willing to speak truth to power, even when it isn't what people want to hear. And that's not the only dimension of taking a stand, but, but I will say that had some engineers at General Motors who knew about faulty ignition switches taken a stand about that, we might not have 51 people who, who died as a result of faulty ignition switches. General Motors might not be paying out hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in compensation to people uh, and fines. Their, their reputation may not have suffered. I could say the same thing about Volkswagen. Had some executives who knew about uh, cheating on emissions taken a stand, they may not be paying billions of dollars in fines and had their reputation suffer. And of course, we, we know of numerous examples on, on Wall Street where had some people taken a stand, uh, companies might not be paying billions of dollars in fines and restitution now. Now with all the business books out there, what makes learning from Marines different? There are some terrific business books out there. Um, there are some terrific uh, how-to in many different dimensions related from, from finance to marketing to administration to Russell's book on, uh, on training and innovation. There are, there are some great books out there. I would never claim that mine is a substitute for those, um, nor is it a how-to book. Uh, in, in many ways, the purpose of my book is to start a discussion on changing culture. We have a culture in this country that has evolved into one that um, respects individuals over teams, respects people and companies in proportion to their net worth, that in far too many cases believes that the art of the deal makes it okay to take advantage of the unsophisticated, the unwary, or the weak, and to take advantage of any loophole and gray area in the law. We need a culture that is more akin to the one I learned as a Marine, which is one that I would say in brief is about doing the right thing for the right reasons all the time, no exceptions. Okay, so your book is basically broken down into 11 principles. Principle one, you talk about uh, the long view approach. Explain that to us and how it relates to business and the battlefield. In the Marine Corps, it's quite clear that all tactics need to be tactics that advance you towards a clearly defined, measurable, long-term strategic objective. And you don't fight a battle just to fight it. You don't fight a battle because you can. You fight a battle only because it, you need to fight that battle as part of advancing towards that clear long-term objective. You would think that in, in the business world that would go without saying, but it doesn't. Take two recent examples. Verizon's recent acquisition of Yahoo and Microsoft's recent acquisition of LinkedIn. The Verizon's acquisition of Yahoo, to me, made total sense given the fact that they had recently acquired AOL. The acquisition of Yahoo and combining it with AOL put them in a much stronger position to achieve a long-term mission of being the, the clear market leader in general internet, entertainment, news, sports, as a website. And they paid a reasonable price. The acquisition of LinkedIn by Microsoft, on the other hand, made absolutely no strategic sense to me whatsoever. A and they paid too much money. But from a strategy standpoint, 
Look, I like LinkedIn. I believe I'm among the first thousand users ever of LinkedIn. Oh, I use it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a LinkedIn pro user. I publish on it. I, I think LinkedIn is a tremendous business resource. We use it in my firm to recruit new people. So this is in no way a reflection on LinkedIn. I quite like the company. But in what way does the acquisition of LinkedIn advance Microsoft to a clearly defined strategic goal? And I would submit that it doesn't. Nor did Microsoft's acquisition of Nokia's handset business, nor did Microsoft's acquisition of Skype or, or of a Quantive. And they've had uh, some pretty significant write downs for two of those. Um, I predict over time there will be some pretty significant write downs with relationship to LinkedIn too. It's a very cool company using very cool cloud uh, computing and storage capabilities that doesn't belong in the Microsoft sphere. It's a, it's a great example of a company that's taking advantage of a battle that didn't need to be fought. Can you share a successful case study using this long view approach that you used in your business dealings? We, of course, try to take the long view in, uh, in two ways in my, in my business. One is with our own business, and two is as we advise clients. Um, in my own business, we've taken the long view of being the clear leader in advising clients within our clearly defined areas of domain expertise. And, and one of my principles that is in the book is about being an expert, which is, which is a little different. Um, and in advising clients, we're always looking to see that our advice is helping them to achieve their long-term strategic goals. So uh, there are multiple examples. Um, as one example, um, we advised the European financial services company called SWIFT. They're a, a, a large company in Europe that helps uh, banks move money between other banks uh, within Europe. Uh, they came to us for help in looking at a specific acquisition opportunity. We work with them, help them understand the company. We looked into the company. We looked into the fit not only from a financial standpoint, but also from a strategic and a cultural standpoint. And, and that's important because most investment banks think of themselves as purely financial advisors. Um, I, I think of our firm as a strategic advisor as much as I do as a financial advisor. And we came to the conclusion that this, the acquisition of this company would not advance SWIFT towards the long-term goals that they had talked to us about. Now, there are many bankers I know who would say, shut up. <laughs> They would say, that's not your job. Your client asked you to help them acquire this company. Your job is to help them. I went to the, uh, to the CEO of Swift and said, I don't think you should buy this company. And, and I gave him the reasons why. And, and again, I would say most bankers would say, you just put your fee at risk. Um, and it's true. Um, he, he agreed. Um, he heard me out. He heard out other people on his staff. He agreed. They did not buy the company. Um, we did not get a fee. But that wasn't the end of the story. They subsequently invited me and several of my other partners to come address the senior management of SWIFT in, a, in an off-site strategy review, asked us to help, help the SWIFT staff understand what to look for in an acquisition candidate, both from a financial standpoint and from a strategic standpoint and from a cultural standpoint. Um, we then helped them identify a different acquisition opportunity, which we did help them complete. We did get a fee. Um, and that also shows that we as a firm were taking the long view in building our own long-term trusted advisory relationship with the client. And it also shows that we were focused on the client's long view, not on the short-term result. Okay, Marine Corps principle two is take a stand. Describe that philosophy for us. What's it all about? There are some people who think of that as meaning to be decisive. Um, and it is true that um, decisiveness is um, a, a Marine Corps leadership trait. Um, Marine Corps leaders are supposed to be decisive and not waffle about things. Um, but there is a second dimension to taking a stand. Um, I referred to it earlier as speaking truth to power. It, it's not always speaking truth to power. It's this willingness 
to stand up and have your opinion be heard and be counted. Now, I say to clients all the time, you pay me for our trusted advice. I can't make you take that advice, but you can't make me give you advice that's not what I believe in. A small example, I, I told you the example of Swift. Mm. We had the New York Stock Exchange as a client. They asked us to advise them on the acquisition of a European company. We couldn't come to financial terms. They, they just wanted too much money for the company. I thought it was a terrific fit f uh, strategically for the New York Stock Exchange. We just couldn't agree on price. The New York Stock Exchange had a fallback position, which was, well, if we can't buy the entire company, perhaps we should just buy 20% of it. And they had a direct conversation with the people on the other side who were also interested in potentially uh, selling them 20% of the company. I looked at that scenario, we, we had a number of conversations about it, and came to the conclusion that it made no strategic sense for them to buy 20%. It made total strategic sense for them to buy the entire company. These are elements of the company that competed with each other. They were also highly complementary in terms of U.S. and European presence. There were tremendous opportunities to reduce costs. There were opportunities for them to stop being in price competition with each other. Um, and uh, quite frankly, the European company was run a little bit uh, too loosely for my taste, a little bit too entrepreneurial. They had a whole bunch of scattershot projects that were going on, and I thought that the New York Stock Exchange could impose some discipline. But if they were to buy 20%, they wouldn't get the cost savings. They would continue to compete. Um, the company would continue to be run by the same people in the same way, just as loosely. I thought it made no sense. Um, I took a stand. I advised the CEO uh, of my opinion. He listened. He talked to his people. And he respectfully disagreed. And he said, OK, I heard you, Ken. We've decided we want to buy it anyway. Um, it wasn't illegal, immoral, or unethical. Mm -hmm. And so. I saluted and I said, okay, and I helped him get the best possible deal with the most protections that we could. Um, you need to take a stand. That doesn't mean that y you need to poke your client in the eye with a sharp stick, and it also doesn't mean that you have to insist that they do what you advise. How often do you refer to the Marine slogan, what now, Lieutenant, and when, confront when we are confronted with a tough business decision? In my head, I refer to it quite often. I don't say it out loud too, too often. Uh, Early in my Marine Corps training, there were a, a series of um, exercises we went through, um, many of which started with a scenario without a resolution. You would, uh, uh, for example, you're on the mortar range one day, um, somebody drops a mortar into the tube, it's supposed to fire, it, it doesn't. Somebody goes up, kicks the mortar, it explodes, and it, and it injures the guy. The next day, you're on the mortar range, Somebody, the same thing happens. Somebody says, go kick the tube, and everybody says, no way, I'm not going, right? What now, Lieutenant? What, what do you do? Mm -hmm. And then there's a discussion about what do you do? And the real point is that as a Marine Corps officer, you can, if there's time, you can get input from various people, but at some point you have to decide. And you have to decide with imperfect information, certainly imperfect information about what the future will bring. And um, you have to take the facts you have, those are the only facts you're going to get when time is up, and you have to make a decision. And I periodically say to myself, what now, Lieutenant? Both in the battlefield and the business world, one faces difficult situations that require that split-second uh, decision. Keeping that in mind, how do you define uh, the situational leadership that you talk about? Let me um, make a distinction between managing and leading. Most people, most of the time, manage. And by that I mean they're given a situation they can't change. That you're given this office in this building at this time and these are the resources that you have and you need to manage them as best you can. Uh, and, and most people work really hard to, to, to make those resources that they have available to them and the constraints that they have to work with and make it work. And, and that's what managing is all about. You're, your territory is limited to this state or this country, and that's what you've got. Leaders need to be willing to challenge the status quo. There's a quote by George Bernard Shaw that I'll probably mangle, but it is something to the effect that 
the reasonable man sees the way the world is and conforms himself to that world. The unreasonable man sees the way the world is and insists on conforming the world to him. There would be no progress without the unreasonable man. And Marines, I think, uh, would fall within that unreasonable category. They don't accept the status quo. They don't accept that these are constraints. And so when we talk about situational leadership, what we're talking about from a leadership standpoint is the ability to see beyond the constraints, to find ways around them, over them, or through them in order to advance yourself or your organization towards those long-term goals, to be creative and to not be hemmed in by constraints that other people think are real, um, but leaders usually find a way around. And what are the three core competencies required to be an effective situational leader? Clearly, the ability to focus on that long-term objective to focus all tactics on achieving those long-term objectives. And by discipline, I don't mean blind obedience to orders. I mean that you it's a discipline in preparing, in planning, in training your team, and in leading them. What solid core marine values should Wall Street be embracing? You know, uh, there are 11 principles in my book, and I believe that they combine to form an ethos that people should, that, that, uh, that people on Wall Street should follow and that people on Main Street should follow, and frankly, I think a lot of people in Washington, D.C. should follow. Um, if I had to boil it down to a tagline, I'd probably say do the right things for the right reasons every time, no excuses. Principle four is know the enemy. So how important is it in business and the battlefield to understand the opposing force or your enemy, as you talk about? The enemy in business is usually not someone trying to kill you, nor are you trying to kill them. Um, in most cases, what we are talking about is a situation in which you are negotiating with somebody who is on the other side of the table. And, and in that context, um, there are many books about negotiating. There, uh, I, I, I took a course up at Harvard from the people who wrote Getting to Yes, and they talk about knowing your best alternative to a negotiated agreement, which I quite agree with. Um, I, I've uh, read and uh, taken classes with other people who've got negotiating tactics, and they talk about things like anchoring, where where the first person to either set a price or a time limit or whatever has some advantage because then everything gets negotiated off of that anchor point. These are all very important. Um, there are also, but what I get to in the book about knowing the other side is about knowing the strengths, weaknesses, capabilities, and in particular, the motivations of the people on the other side of the table. Nobody thinks of themselves as a bad guy, mm -hmm. right? Nobody thinks of themselves as irrational. Nobody thinks that what they're asking for is unreasonable. You may think that of them, mm -hmm. but they don't think that of themselves. To the extent that you can understand the constraints that the people on the other side are under, to the extent you can understand why they want what they want, it puts you in a much stronger position to negotiate a solution that they're likely to accept and you are. Now, I'm not in any way advocating being a wimp. I'm not advocating going native. I'm not advocating that just because somebody wants something that you have to give them that something. Um, that's different. Um, when I work for a seller, part of our job is to help that seller get the best possible price. When I work for a buyer, part of our job is to help that buyer pay the lowest possible price. But we also want to get a deal done. So understanding those strengths, weaknesses, capabilities and motivations of the people on the other side of the table are key to getting that done. Those other things that we talked about, anchoring and best alternative to a negotiated agreement and the like, are tactics that you use in order to try to get to that agreement. But if you don't understand the other side, you'll never get there. Can you share a case study of when you use the approach, know your enemy? 
there are so many because every single deal we use, um, I, I actually um, sometimes like to talk about ones in which I was personally involved with as opposed to where I advised a client, al although there are clearly many. I say to people that I, I was never so focused on the words in an agreement as when it was my money going to, to buy my company or my money when I was trying to sell it or my money when we were making an acquisition for my company. But certainly uh, the first technology company that I ever had a, a material ownership interest in is one that um, where we bought the assets to form that company from a consortium uh, that was controlled by Swiss banks. And they had bought those assets from Standard & Poor's several years earlier. And I understood why they had bought those assets in the beginning. I understood that they valued a stream of information that was coming out of the software that they had bought. And I also understood why they were open to selling it. And, and it was in part because they were fixated on meeting the needs of the back office of Swiss banks, whereas these software assets were really more appropriate for meeting the needs of traders, and those interests are different. And I understood that they were frustrated at the lack of compatibility between those assets and what they needed. Uh, I also understood that the key negotiator for the Swiss was not the guy who had acquired those assets to begin with, and therefore he wouldn't be embarrassed for having made a bad decision. And, and having understood him, I could negotiate a deal with him um, that worked out to be win-win, and, and it worked. Uh, let's go to principle five, which is know what the object is, is worth. What are the four factors you used on the battlefield that you deployed in business when valuing different companies? So I think the key here is that um, bankers have a few methods that they tend to use in valuing merger and acquisition transactions, in valuing whether somebody should build a pipeline or build a sewer system or build a railroad trestle. It works in the bond world, it works everywhere. And these methodologies are financial. They are discounted cash flow analysis is one, how much money is going to go out, how much money is going to go in, when's it going to come in, how do I apply the time value of money to that, how do I apply risk factors to that, and then sometimes they're supplemented by other financial approaches depending on the transaction we're talking about where they look at so-called comparable transactions. No Marine would look at the price we paid for Guadalcanal with its one airstrip uh, and the number of people lost and the number of ships lost and somehow use that information to calculate how much we should pay for Iwo Jima, how many lives we should spend, how many ships should be lost. It's dumb. It's asinine. Um, so Marines look at these things in a very different way. Um, the first one is simply how critical is achieving this goal to the long-term mission? Because if it's not critical, why fight that battle? And in fact, there, there are many examples throughout history, World War II island hopping, uh, plenty of times in Iraq and Afghanistan, where people simply chose not to fight the battle because it wasn't that critical. It's too bad Hewlett Packard didn't decide not to make some of their acquisitions. It's too bad Microsoft didn't decide not to make some of those deals. You don't have to fight every battle. How critical is it? And then you have to assess the downside risk of losing. This is not something people like to do. People like to, when, when you ask people the question, was it worth it? They answer it in terms of whether they won or they lost. If they fought the battle and won, then they say, yes, it was worth it. If they fought the battle and lost, they say, well, no, it wasn't worth it. Well, you have to say, is it worth fighting this battle even if you lose? How important is it? You have to look at the resources available. Do you have the resources available to you to be successful? And you have to look at that risk-reward trade-off. These are all critical. And none of them are financial. That is not to say that in business one should ignore the finances. Not at all. It, it is a factor, but it can't be the only factor.
Tell us about a company who did not consider this approach before a buyout. There, uh, you know, we can look at this from the perspective of the buyer. We can look at this from the perspective of the seller. Uh, you know, I had a client one time that was asked us to help them uh, buy their company, actually basically find a new owner. There was a company, the CEO of the subsidiary came to us, the current owner was merging, they no longer had the attention, were open to sell it, the management team wanted us to help them find a buyer, pull the company out and, uh, and go forward with, uh, with a new partner. Um, we identified several different uh, parties, one of which offered a package which on the top line appeared to be quite superior in value to all the rest. It, it simply looked like it was way more money. But a small portion of that money was up front. A much larger portion of that was to be paid out over time ba based on performance. We assessed that situation and said, we, we looked at how important was it that you make that transaction. And we said, well, actually, you have alternatives. You, that's, this is not the only transaction. We, we looked at the risk and the reward trade-off and said, when we did some due diligence on the acquiring company and said, they don't have the greatest reputation out there. We looked at how much was up front versus how much was in the, in the back end, and we said, they're not paying you enough up front. But the client was totally focused only on that top line number. And, uh, and insisted on going forwards. Um, they did, uh, that, as was their right. Um, we advised them to go in a different direction. Um, within a year, the top management of the company was out. They did not get paid the majority of the, of the back end payout. Um, they were only looking at, at, at the numbers. They were only looking at the spreadsheet and they weren't looking at the bigger picture. What kind of financial risk analysis is important to consider during mergers and acquisitions? Look, all financial analysis is extremely important. Whether we're working with a buyer or we're working with a seller, we help develop very detailed cash flow models that project cash flows out uh, usually five years into the future. They're, they're very detailed. They understand that revenue is price times quantity. We break down various sources of revenue. We look at product mix. We look at changes of price over time. We look at all the various elements of the cost structure, people costs, support costs, sales costs, rent costs. We project it all out in detail. Here's the problem. It's all projections. It's all subject to manipulation. It's all subject to somebody's opinion as to what the economy will do, what the rate of growth will be, what inflation will be, and a thousand other factors. So it's important to do the financial analysis. It, it's important to, to make sure, it, it, it sometimes can help you, it can stop you from doing something foolish. It sometimes can point out if you're a buyer that a seller has not fully baked in the costs of growth into the company, it can be very helpful directionally, but you can't 100% rely on that financial analysis. You have to go beyond that. Principle six in your book is know yourself. How has the Marine Code of Honor helped you personally and professionally? Let me separate that into two parts. Um, the know yourself here, um, uh, General James Mattis is a fairly famous Marine, uh, led the, the Marines in Iraq uh, and, and then led, later led the entire Marine Corps. I'll paraphrase a quote which is to say you, you need to be brutally honest with yourself. If you fool yourself the results are, are not going to be good. You need to, to be brutally honest with your own capabilities, your own resources and know what is doable. We have too many CEOs who overreach. We have too many politicians who, who, who promise things that they cannot possibly deliver on. Um, you have to know what's possible and know what can be done or, or the results can be catastrophic. And in the book, I, I, I talk some more about how one does that. The Marine Corps Code of Honor is not exactly about knowing yourself. It, it's about being true to yourself. Marine Corps has a motto, Semper Fidelis, always faithful. 
and it is always faithful to God, core, and country. And it's always faithful. It's not some of the time. Um, and it is a, a, a variant on do the right thing for the right reasons every time, no exceptions. Now, how did you leverage this code to help grow your own company, Marlin and Associates? Well, I think what I leveraged was the 11 principles. And as part of that, I uh, absolutely um, doing things with honor is a part of it. Um, I have a slight digression in the book. It didn't really fit, but I wanted to fit it in someplace um, where I talk about um, the object of life. Um, the object of life, to be clear, is different from the meaning of life. I have not yet figured out the meaning of life. Um, and I do know that some people who believe that the object of life is to accumulate the most toys. Um, I've evolved a, an object of life, which is to maximize volume, and volume has four dimensions. Um, the first three are fairly easy to talk about. They're length, width, and breadth. Um, length um, is not exactly the amount of time that you're on the planet, um, it's, uh, it, but, but it has to do with the amount of time you're on the planet, and, and also it has to do with the amount of time that you spend learning things. Um, width has to do with the number of different experiences you have while you're on the planet. Um, you, uh, you may be in the news business uh, at, at right now, uh, but at some other time you may have uh, played classical violin or been a soccer player or something or traveled to Machu Picchu or done other things that give you width in life. Um, depth has to do with how deep you get into any one of those experiences. Um, so if we take Mozart who died at about 35, I think, um, had tremendous volume in his life. He, he had, uh, didn't have a whole lot of length, but he had great width. He visited all the courts of Europe and, and huge depth in, in his music, so he had great volume. Um, but I did say that um, volume has four dimensions, not three. And, and the fourth is honor, um, because I don't care how good a serial murderer you are, right? You get zero volume from that. It, it, volume is a multiplier. And the flip side of that is, uh, um, Mother Teresa, and, and, and I'm not Catholic, um, gets a tremendous multiplier for the honor that she showed in, in what she did. And so when you, you can't exactly multiply these things, I, I don't know how you do the arithmetic, but, uh, but if you do take length, width, depth, uh, and, and honor, y you can get a measure of volume, and the object of life, in my view, is to maximize volume. How did the Marine Corps principle control the timing help you with this subservo buyout that you were involved with? First thing I should say is that when I talk to people, uh, clients, about controlling the, um, the timing, they very often think it has something to do with surprise. And um, I tell people this has nothing to do with surprise. Uh, Saddam Hussein could not have been surprised when the Allied forces uh, attacked and, and kicked him out of Kuwait, he, he probably watched the buildup for months on CNN. And yet he, he couldn't stop it because the Allied forces controlled the timing. Um, in the Yom Kippur War, the Egyptians and the Syrians surprised the Israelis. But shortly thereafter, the Israelis managed to get control of the process and were able to win that war. So, so this is about in, in whether we're talking about mergers, acquisitions, or, or other strategic actions that a company takes. It could be the launch of a new product. It could be opening your Shanghai office. It could be any one of a number of things. It's about the importance of controlling the timing and making sure that these actions happen when you have the resources in place, both the material as well as the people resources, when you're not being conflicted or constrained by other things that are going on, and when you can do your best to ensure success. Uh, and, and I talk uh, quite a bit about that. Um, in the case of uh, Subservio, which you're talking about, which was a Canadian client that we had uh, a few years ago, and I use this as an example in the book, we had a a client that was um, being led by a very talented young woman, a CEO, um, who had built and successfully sold another company that was backed by uh, some financial sponsors, um, but hadn't made a whole lot of money in that earlier sale. She didn't own a whole lot of the, of the equity, she owned some, and 
So it was looking to this deal, uh, this company, uh, they did plan to sell it. It was backed by financial sponsors. Um, they planned to grow it and sell it in a few years uh, for a lot of money, and she planned to make a lot of money. We'd been talking to them for quite some time. We understood that in a few years that uh, they'd look to sell the company, and we'd probably advise them in the process. Um, and they were approached by another company that was themselves trying to control the timing. The other company identified this company. It was fast growing, uh, using you know, hot technology in a hot space, uh, fully buzzword compliant, cloud-based, uh, uh, mobile-based, uh, B2B, recurring revenue, all these good things. And the other company wanted to buy them now while it wouldn't be expensive. And they came to us and said, what should we do? And, and the answer um, that we gave them was a, in large part about regaining control of the situation uh, and in, in, including control of the timing. And, and basically, slightly complex story, but to simplify it a bit, we work with them to put together uh, not only a cash flow forecast, um, but a forecast of the likely value of this company in four or five years, which is when they had planned to sell the company. Um, we uh, went to the, the proposed buyer and basically said, um, we have no plans to sell the company right now, but we do have plans to sell the company. Um, it'll be in four or five years. Here's the value we are pretty confident we can get in four or five years. Here's why we're pretty confident of that. We're not just making these numbers up. If you're interested in buying this company now, um, it doesn't have to be quite at the price we'll get in four or five years. We understand the discount for certainty, but it's going to have to be worth a, a lot more than what the paper would, the, a, a financial analysis would otherwise tell you the company is worth right now, it would have to be a number close to where we think we can be in four or five years. And uh, I, I don't want to get too complicated here, but through a lot of conversation back and forth, uh, ultimately, we were able to regain control of the timing and we were able to help them effect a sale at, at a good price. Principle eight is negotiate from the high ground. So tell us about a successful transaction where you negotiate from the high ground in spite of being bullied. I can't imagine you being bullied though, but. Did that actually happen? Um, Marines don't bully yeah. well. <laughs> they, yeah, they don't bully. Um, so first of all, I should say that negotiating from the high ground has two connotations. Um, one, of course, is tactically it's the place you want to be. It's the place where you have leverage. It's the place, uh, you know, uh, physically, if you were talking about a combat situation, it's literally the high ground. It's the top of the hill. You can see everything all around you. You can rain fire on those uh, below you. Much easier to rain fire on the people below you than for them to fire coming up. Much easier to defend. And sticking with that aspect of it for a minute, um, it, it's where... I think Donald Trump in The Art of the Deal would talk about w w looking at areas in which you have negotiating leverage, in which you have a stronger position than the people who are on the other side of the table and, and, and ways in which you can take advantage of that. But there is a second connotation to negotiating from the high ground that's missing from The Art of the Deal. And that has to do with the moral high ground. That has to do with doing the right thing for the right reasons. It has to do with not taking advantage of the unsophisticated, unwary, or weak simply because you can. And I am a big believer that Marines don't do that. Marines don't take advantage of the weak. Marines protect the weak. Again, I am not a socialist. I make money. I want my people to make money, um, and I am not advising that people sort of roll over and <laughs> give money to people and leave it on the table, um, but at the end of the day, I want to feel good about the negotiations. Uh, I tell my people, we don't lie, and we don't let our clients lie. Um, if we give our word that we will do something, we do it. Whether we are contractually and legally required to do it or not, we gave our word. And that's all part of negotiating from the high ground. Y you mentioned being bullied, and, and you're probably referring to a vignette that I had in the book. We had a UK-based client um, 
that uh, was backed by Goldman Sachs and uh, one of George Soros's funds uh, and led by two founders was a software company that addressed the hedge fund world and uh, had a lot of people coming after them looking to buy them. Um, they asked us for help. We um, negotiated with several different parties. Um, there was a U.S. company that I won't name who actually had a, had a U.K. head that the founders quite liked and got along with him quite well, and that guy was appointed as the lead negotiator, and we negotiated a deal. We thought we had a deal. The um, next thing we knew, the U.K. negotiator was overruled by his boss, the CEO back in the United States, and was um, forced by his boss to come back and change some of the terms that we had previously agreed to. We decided to go and uh, have a meeting with the CEO back in the United States and walked into the room, and, and the guy absolutely thought that he had all the leverage. Um, he thought that this thing was all about the money, um, and he was uh, what I would call a bully wannabe. Um, and, uh, and he proceeded to tell us in, in fairly clear and no uncertain terms about um, his deal was the best uh, we were going to get. It was a great deal, and yes, he changed the terms, but uh, he looked at it and he decided that was what was fair and that was what we were going to take. We said thank you very much. We left the room politely and then walked away and told him, we're not selling the company to you. Now, that was a bit of a gutsy move on the part of my client. Um, I, I, I did advise it. Um, because I'm, I'm conflating this story because this negotiation had gone on for nearly six months and, and during that period of time we had agreed not to talk to anyone else. So while we had talked to people six months ago, um, we hadn't talked to anybody in, for six months. Um, that was our agreement and, and we lived by our agreement. And so while we did know that there were other companies that had been interested six months earlier, um, things had changed. And we could not know for certain that there was another buyer in the wings. But uh, I, I certainly said to the client, I wouldn't work for this guy, <laughs> would you? Right? And they said, no. <laughs> this was a negotiator on the other side that didn't understand the high ground. Um, he also didn't understand the motivations of the people on the other side of the table. <laughs> Uh, and uh, he misunderstood his own strengths. He, he thought because he was the high bidder, he could right. dictate terms. Marine Corps Principle 9 is seek foreign entanglements. How did your battles in foreign countries help you with battles in the overseas boardrooms? Well, I, I think seeking foreign entanglements is an important thing for leaders of U.S. businesses in general, um, and it's an important dimension that bankers and consultants need to have when they're advising clients. So about a third of our clients are based outside of the United States today. About 50% of our transactions involve a non-U.S. participant. So sometimes it's a U.S. client, but a, but a, a non-U.S. player. And within that, I would say about 20% of our transactions never touch U.S. shores. They're, they're non-U.S. to non-U.S. That um, ability to work with people and companies outside the United States, I think is absolutely essential in the modern business environment. If you are constrained by geographic borders, you are constraining your abilities to grow, to thrive, and to win. I first, I think, began to develop an appreciation for the differences between our culture and others when I was in the Marine Corps, and I spent time, I think, in 13 different countries when I was in the Marine Corps, uh, you know, from the Philippines and Hong Kong and Australia and Japan and Korea and, and uh, in several places in Western Europe. And you begin to understand that different cultures have different ways of doing things and that doesn't make them wrong. It just makes them different, including in, in many cases, literally a different sense of right and wrong. Um, of acceptable and non-acceptable behavior, um, of different negotiating styles, of sometimes of a different meaning for the word yes and the word no. As bankers, we not have to not only have to understand the difference in cultural aspects, but sometimes in in accounting practices, in the way in which business is conducted, 
And we've taken that approach from the beginning in my company, the, the, the international approach. When we work with a seller, we look for buyers around the world, wherever they may be. When we work with a buyer, we often look for sellers in, in various parts of the world that help advance their strategy. Um, sometimes we're hired specifically, we're hired right now specifically to help somebody find a way to advance their strategy in Asia. That international approach is, is extremely important to us. Um, I believe that international approach, it, it should be important to most American businesses. You know, I'm not applying this to the dry cleaning plant in Casper, Wyoming. Of course, I, I am talking about larger businesses that have that ability to grow beyond our borders. Um, I, I think the ability to embrace non-U.S. cultures is something that I wish more of our politicians had and, and were sort of less afraid of, of people in, in other countries and other cultures. Growing interlinks of globalization has its impact on an organization's financial production and services aspects. How would you explain this and how should an organization form their global strategy to handle this phenomenon? To begin with, I'll say that my book is not a how-to book. Um, in, in each element of growing a business, um, one could write volumes. And, and certainly in, in developing an international practice, my one short chapter on seeking foreign entanglements is not going to be enough for, for anyone. It, it's really a bit of a primer both on why you should, and, and I also have some rules of international negotiating in there that people should, should think about. The very complex acts of establishing an international business depend on the international business the, on the business itself and on their strengths, weaknesses, capabilities, and motivations. And as a small example of that, um, I, I told you that 50% of our transactions involved a non-U.S. player and 30% of our clients, or about a third of our clients, mm -hmm. are based outside the United, the United States. We don't have an office outside the United States. Well, we have an office in Toronto, but we have no office in Europe, nor, nor do we have one in, in Asia. We have offices in New York, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, and Toronto. Um, and from those offices, though, we spend a tremendous amount of time in Europe and in Asia and in Australia developing business and executing business. So it isn't always required for every business that you set up an office there. It's it, it's very situational. Principle 10 is trust and verify. Explain the importance of the trust verify due diligence principle during negotiations. I'm quite familiar with Ronald Reagan and Rickovic who um, didn't coin the phrase trust but verify, but he, uh, he certainly popularized it uh, uh, when negotiating, I, I think, with Gorbachev. Um, I, I changed trust uh, but verify to, ch to trust and verify really to make a, a fairly simple point, which is that it, there are no agreements without trust. You know, the, the trust but language sort of takes away from the word trust, and, and when you say trust but verify it, it makes it seem like all the emphasis is on the verify. There are no treaties that can be signed, there are no contracts that can be signed that don't have an element of trust to them. If you sign a contract with an employer and that employer promises to pay you a gazillion dollars a year for the rest of your life, you're trusting that they'll still be around, that some lawyer won't find a way, a loophole in it. Um, there's, there's always some level of trust when you enter into an agreement with another party. And without some level of trust, there can be no agreement. You, you'll never get there. And you can't, you just can't protect against everything. I, I can tell you about a deal I lost. It was uh, with a Japanese company um, because the Japanese were quite used to contracts that were short and basically say we're each going to do the right thing for each other versus the Americans who insisted on very long detailed contracts in an attempt to protect the client from every possible thing that could possibly go wrong no matter how, how unlikely. Uh, the Japanese came at it from the perspective of a wedding contract mm -hmm. and the, the Americans came at it from the perspective of a prenup. We never got to a deal. It, it just became too hard and the, and the Japanese walked away from it. Um, 
so the trust part is important, and, and that means you have to know the people on the other side. Um, you have to know your own capabilities, and you have to figure out whether you can trust them. But trust alone is, is foolish. You do have to verify. And in the merger and acquisition world, that process of verifying is often referred to as due diligence reviews. Um, due diligence reviews is something that comes out of a legal term um, uh, given uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, other uh, laws in the US and Europe and Asia, CEOs are can, can be held personally liable in some cases and their companies can be subject to lawsuit if they enter into agreements in which they did not exercise due care and due diligence to make sure that everything was proper and above board. And some of these due diligence reviews can be extremely detailed. And we help buyers to conduct due diligence reviews when we're working with the buyer. When we're working with sellers, we usually help them manage the due diligence review by the buyer. And sometimes you have to do both because if, the, if we're working with a seller, but the buyer is, for example, going to pay you over time, then we have to ascertain that the buyer has the wherewithal to pay you over time. If the buyer is going to pay you with stock, we have to do some work to verify that the stock is actually worth something. There was a case written up in the New York Times a few years ago in which a husband and wife started a company in the voice recognition business um, think of Siri on your phone, you know, developed a, a, a voice recognition uh, capability that uh, can, could be used in a, in a variety of ways. It was an attractive company. There were a number of people who were interested in buying it. They were advised by a, a well-respected investment banking firm. They solicited bids with the advice of their bankers, um, accepted an all-stock offer from a company. Um, a few months later, it, it was revealed that that company that paid them with stock um, uh, wasn't doing as well as they told people. The stock uh, cratered, the company went bankrupt, the stock became worthless. So now the husband and wife no longer had their company uh, and had a bunch of worthless stock. Now, in many cases, you would say, that's the breaks. Sorry that happened. The only thing a bit odd here was that um, the bankers that had advised them, that firm also had a private equity arm. The private equity arm had looked into investing into the company that bought them and had done due diligence on that company and had come to the conclusion that there was no way that they would buy that stock. The point was that it was possible to do due diligence right. and to ascertain that that stock might not be worth what the buyers said it was worth. And it wasn't done. Now, in that case, the husband and wife sued and they lost. Um, and the courts held that it is not the banker's responsibility to do due diligence. It was the banker's responsibility to give their best considered advice and it was up to the husband and wife as to whether they took that advice. And from a legal standpoint, I get that. From a moral high ground standpoint, I get, it's my opinion, that the banker should have helped them do better due diligence. Finally, principle number 11, be disciplined. Why do you think bankers and politicians should adopt the marine disciplined approach and which leaders have successfully embraced this? When I talk about discipline in business, discipline in the political arena, discipline on Wall Street, I, I am not talking about blind obedience to orders. Um, I'm talking about being disciplined in your planning, being disciplined in your preparation, being disciplined in your execution. I'm talking about not skipping steps, not being lazy, having disciplined processes. Because without them, you're just courting disaster. There are companies like General Electric and like Warren, people like Warren Buffett who are renowned for being disciplined in their planning and preparation and execution. Um, it is not an approach that is limited to Marines. Um, but we see way too many lazy people or people who just don't know any better. 
We see them as CEOs, we see them as bankers, we see them as politicians. I believe that there are some very competent bankers out there, so, so let nothing that I say imply that all bankers or even most bankers are, are this way. I, I, I've seen some great ones uh, that, uh, you know, in, in a lot of different areas. I, I work with a guy named John Veronis and John Suler, who were bankers who were, who were very disciplined in their approach. Uh, uh, I worked with Goldman Sachs a long time ago and a banker named Jeff Boisey, who was very, very disciplined in his approach. Uh, we recently worked with uh, Blackstone and saw some very disciplined bankers. So I don't mean to imply that they are all uh, a bunch of lazy crooks. It's not true. But we also work with a number who, and, and have seen a number who sort of seem to do the minimum. Tell us, how has this discipline principle guided you in any of your business transactions or decisions? We, you know, I, I use the term we because I tend to think of that as a firm, but, you know, in forming the, the firm that I have now and in helping to guide it and helping to set a culture, um, it's all about not skipping steps. It's all about doing the right things for the right reasons every time, no exceptions. It's all about disciplined, careful planning before we act, careful preparation, knowing ourselves, knowing the people on the other side. It's about taking a stand with our clients, telling our clients we're not ready to go right now, all right, or we are ready to go right now and it's time to stop waffling. It's about embracing the international aspects of the, of the transaction and seeking foreign entanglements. Um, it's about using experts. I'm uh, sometimes surprised at the level to which we have become a nation of generalists. My father is a retired uh, mechanical engineer. He's got his master's degree in thermodynamics. He used to work at the Cummins Engine Company, and he used to talk about some of the leaders at Cummins who were very smart people, um, went to top schools, had top MBAs, knew a lot about finance, they knew about labor negotiating, they knew about motivating people, they knew about sales and marketing, and they didn't know a piston rod from a crankshaft. How do you run the Cummins Engine Company if you don't understand engines? How do you lead them to the next level in where engines are going? And the answer is, you can't. You can manage, but you can't lead. We have too many generalist CEOs. We have too many generalist bankers who think that they can advise an aerospace company one day and a dog food company the next because they think it's only about process. We have too many generalist politicians who think because they know how to get elected and re-elected that that qualifies them to have an opinion on Social Security or NASA or, or, or the defense budget or, or agriculture when they have not developed any particular level of expertise. By the way, again, I, I say we have too many of them. I don't mean to imply that there aren't some who have developed those levels of expertise. We just have too many who haven't. So uh, absolutely all 11 of those principles have guided me in, in how we have formed the firm and how we run the firm and how we advise our clients. And are there one or two Marine Corps principles we should always have in our arsenal so we can su succeed ethically in our careers? I consciously did not write a book about ethics. Um, I'll answer your question because there are, but, um, but this is not a, a book in which I'm uh, trying to teach people somehow to be morally superior. Um, this is a book about 11 principles that people can use to run a better business and feel better about themselves along the way. So things like taking the long view are not about ethics. They're about a smart way to run a business. Thinking now, think, think, taking a stand and speaking truth to power is not really a, a, an ethical matter other than being true to yourself. Principles such as seeking foreign entanglements or knowing yourself or knowing the people on the other side or being an expert or even about being disciplined are not about ethics, they're about a smarter way to run the business. But I will say that all of these things have a multiplier for honor. Because if you do all these things, but you don't do it with honor, it doesn't matter, you will fail. Ken Marlin, thank you so much for joining us today. It was an honor having you on. Thank you, Tracy, thank you for having me.
And that just about does it for this edition of Sarder TV. We hope you enjoyed and learned something new today. Until next time, I'm Tracy Fitzpatrick. Thanks for watching.